right? So here's John this last summer. He's now 38, and he has his own three-year-olds to, to, to say that to him. And he doesn't say, how do you know anymore? He now says, how do you know? Okay? But that is the main question. How do you know what these things that they told you in school? Well, there are four ways we could talk about of knowing. And two of them are shown on this, uh, this manuscript from the Carolingian book painter. If we zoom in on the top frame, here's Moses on Mount Sinai. So the first way of knowing is divine authority. Right? Here, he's going to be the, he's the graduate student here getting the word. Here's a teaching assistant over on the left, perhaps, <laughs> Aaron. Right? And then he comes down from Sinai, right, to see the class, the children of Israel, right? So here's another kind of authority, right, which is human authority interpreting the scriptures. And here the, you can see the class. I mean, the guy's going like, hmm, like that, right? Okay, and the teaching assistant is off in the side still, right? But this doesn't make it. Science is not faith-based, Right? That may be other ways, there may be other things you know that way, but not science. Okay? Science ignores divine authority and it ignores human authority. Not that they might not exist, but they don't relate to science. Okay? Now, as you walked in today, did you notice these things over here? There's an honor roll of chemists, and in fact, we'll use that a lot this semester. And in particular, uh, one of the people on there is Michael Faraday, who started in a very humble way. He was a bookbinder's apprentice. And he bound this book, not this particular copy, but this book, which is called Conversations on Chemistry. He bound the first edition. This one is, is a later edition. And let me... So you see, it's conversations on chemistry in which elements of that science are familiarly explained and illustrated by experiments. And who's the author? J.L. Comstock. He is actually not the author. He's the guy who stole it. Okay. He stole it from a woman, Mrs. Marset, in England, who wrote this book, which was the most popular textbook. It was written for girls. But it was the most popular textbook in all, in all uh, uh, chemistry for the first half of the 19th century. It went through like 20-some uh, editions. In the, and here, here you see at the beginning, it's, it's a dialogue, a conversation between Mrs. B and Caroline and Emily. And it's fun to see this here, what Emily says at the beginning. To confess the truth, Mrs. B, I'm not disposed to form a very favorable idea of chemistry nor do I expect to derive much entertainment from it. But in the long run, as you can imagine, they have a lot of fun with chemistry. It was a wonderful book, and still is. But he was binding it and read it. And look what he says about this as his in introduction to be the leading experimental scientist of the 19th century. Do not suppose I was a very deep thinker or was marked as a precocious person. I was a very lively, imaginative person and could believe in the Arabian Nights as easily as the encyclopedia. But facts were important to me and saved me. I could trust the fact and always cross-examined an assertion. So when I questioned Mrs. Marset's book by such little experiments as I could find means to perform and found it true to the facts as I could understand them, I felt I had got hold of an anchor in chemical knowledge and clung fast to it. Right? So the experiments were what did it. So the third way of knowing is by experimental observation. Right? And here's Richard Feynman. How many of you heard of Richard Feynman? He's a really great physicist, wrote a wonderful textbook as well as getting all sorts of prizes and so on. He spoke to the National Science Teachers Association in 1966 saying, learn from science that you must doubt the experts. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. When someone says science teaches such and such, he's using the word incorrectly. Science doesn't teach it. Experience teaches it. If they say to you, science has shown such and such, you might ask, how does science show it? 
How did the scientists find out? How? What? Where? Not science has shown, but this experiment or this effect has shown. Right? Now, why do we quote Feynman? Because he's an expert. <laughs> Wrong. Okay? Though literally, expert, the, the etymology of expert is it means someone who has done experiments. Okay? We quote him because what he says makes sense. Okay? So logic is the fourth way of knowing things. So the two ways that we that we know things in chemistry or in science are experiment and logic. And the, the lecture is a little bit more focused on logic and lab is more focused on experiment and you get an unbalanced view if you do one without the other. Okay, so modern science got underway in the 17th century. There's the 17th century, 1600 to 1700, right? And 1638 was when New Haven Colony was founded and 1701 was when Yale was founded. So that's when everything got underway, just when this enterprise was beginning here. Okay? Here we are. Okay? If you go back 100 years, you get to quantum, quantization by Planck, and we'll talk about that. And if you go back another 100 years, you get to Lavoisier and oxidation, and we'll talk about that. And if you get another 100 years, you get to Newton and gravitation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And if you go back a little more than another hundred years, you get to Copernicus and, and the revolution of the heavenly bodies, and Columbus and navigation, and Luther and the Reformation. And these things all have something in common, right? As Robert Hooke wrote, the 17th century, his age, was an age of all others the most inquisitive. All these things have to, with, to do with people inquiring into how people know things and finding out new things. Okay? And in particular, an important figure was, was Francis Bacon who, and his instauration. Now, you might not know the instauration, so well, let's look at that. Here's Francis Bacon. There are his years. He, he was Elizabethan and Jacobean. He was almost exactly contemporary with Shakespeare and with Galileo. He went to school at, at a university at Cambridge. And here's a cartoon uh, that shows him in, uh, imagine, uh, it's a modern cartoon, imagining him in a class at Cambridge. Because he wrote of his tutors at Cambridge, they were men of sharp wits, shut up in their cells of a few authors, chiefly Aristotle, their dictator. Right? All the philosophy of nature, philosophy meant science in those days, all the philosophy of nature which is now received is either the philosophy of the Grecians or that of the alchemists. The one is gathered out of a few vulgar, that means common, of course, observations, and the other out of a few experiments of a furnace. The one never faileth to multiply words, and the other ever faileth to multiply gold. So here's the book he wrote, the instauration. That's the frontispiece for him. This picture's from the Beinecke Library. We went down and got a picture of the book. Okay, notice it was published in 1620. What else happened then? 